What's going on guys? Michael here. What, you guys thought you'd get through a whole Live Love Spa event without seeing me? <laughs> you should know better than that by now. I really wish I could be there with all of you. I'm sure you're having an amazing event, sparking all kinds of conversations, creating new memories, ideas. And let's see, it's, uh, it's Sunday there, Sunday morning. Um, so yesterday was Saturday night. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep. I can see it. I see all the hangovers out there. That means things are going very well. Nice. So um, I was tasked by my wonderful Live Low Spot team to take the term, the idea, the meaning of leadership, strip it down and see what the heck does leadership really look like. So I called some of my closest amigos and amigas in the industry that I look up to as leaders. They're all in different stages of their journeys. They work in different areas of our industry, but they all have a unique perspective on what leadership is and also what leadership is not. What do you, what do you think some of the biggest misconceptions um, that uh, those not in leadership roles yet have about leadership? I think probably a big common misconception is that leaders are perfect. Leaders have it all figured out. So, you know, we hear this all the time. It's not managing people, it's leading people. And it's leading people to follow your vision or to follow your team's vision. They get confused between managing or micromanaging, telling people what to do versus inspiring them to do things and be creative. Maybe having to be a little bit too heavy handed or having to push too much control onto the team. Maybe that their way is the only way, which potentially inhibits people from contributing or... Yeah, we got off to a jump start on what leadership is not. And it didn't take long to realize what leadership is. And it's really not something that is internal or self-reflected. Leadership is really the effect that an individual is having within their team. And the true metric for success in leadership is really determined by the effect you have on that team. You work for your team. So I think leadership is about working for the people that are following your vision and your roadmap and how do you get them involved in following that roadmap and how do you make them feel that they're they're part of that work so for me leadership is never about what's on the name badge it's about serving your team it's about building a team and taking them with you eventually you get to a point and maybe it's because you have some more support underneath you or maybe it's because you have kind of mentally evolved a bit where you are setting more of a strategic vision and a plan and delegating more of those day-to-day -day tasks so you freed up your physical time you freed up your mental time to really think and be creative and help the team motivate the team empower the team sort of work through the team to achieve your your larger goals and your larger vision not only knowing the direction or helping figure out the direction that an organization should go in, but bringing all the people along and inspiring them to be doing things uh, consistent with that vision. Um, they'll, they'll grow in trust in you as a leader, um, and you'll so slowly see their viewpoint, their skill set, morph into their own leadership style um, and ability to, to lead and grow a team under you. You know, we all, we all look at leadership like it sounds uh, so great and and it is but there's always two sides to every coin you know leading and driving a team but also being able to identify and weed out problems within a team or an organization kind of reminds me of a beast mentality everyone we kind of have this this compliment in business now like hey that guy is a beast or that girl is a beast you know which means she's the boss and beast mode um everybody says they want to be a beast and uh until it's time to do what a beast actually has to do make hard decisions about changes, decisions that impact uh, not only themselves, but, you know, many people. Listen, um, I think the biggest challenges in leadership, at least for me, my, my greatest challenge is, is when you have something that's okay. And, you know, they have that term in the book, you know, good to great, right? How do you get from good to great? And when you're making changes in areas um, where you're good and you want to get to great sometimes those are the most painful I, I like you Michael I, I I always thought I could ch I always think everyone's got something in then that's brilliant you know you can't help it but sometimes you just have to understand they do but it's not in the direction you think they need to go in or they may think they need to go in like if you have a, a, an underperforming employee and they're really underperforming it's relatively straightforward to um, you know to make those changes but it's when things are okay those are very difficult changes to make, especially with personnel. 
And, and for me, that's often the hardest thing, especially when you have a great person that's just in the wrong spot. You know, they're the square peg in a round hole. Um, those are the ones that I struggle with the most. Right. Okay, let me ask, gracefully, <laughs> as I may, uh, without trying to date anyone or anything, how long have you been uh, working in this industry? Oh, wow. Let's see. In 2000, 2006. If that depends if you count what I would constitute as potentially child labor, because I started in my um, stepfather's hair salon when I was about 12. <laughs> I, I think my, my younger self was certainly uh, full of confidence back in 2002 and 2003. You know, I've been in the, so I hate to say it because I'm only 23, but I've been, in, I've been in the industry 40 years. I started in hairstyling, hairdressing, and so I've been doing it since I was 18 years old. So, um, of course, only 10 years, but um, really. <laughs> I asked that question because there's something about leadership that can't be learned in books or in courses or through advice. Um, it's this time-tested experience. This is usually why people don't come out of school and start in leadership. Time and experience seem to be the, the last thing to mold leaders and, and make them truly special, even when faced with um, you know global disasters like a pandemic. Their experience in handling difficult situations can guide them and their teams through even the most extraordinary circumstances. China has identified the cause of the mysterious new virus. Coronavirus. Coronavirus. There are fears a rapidly spreading virus has reached Australia. This is a rapidly emerging situation where there is not a cause for alarm. The first U.S. case has been detected. Obviously, there's no parallels to the uh, sort of global health crisis that we are just uh, still going through right now. But the, the 2008, 2009, uh, financial crisis hit our industry really hard. And I believe it was the first real downturn that a lot of people in our industry ever saw because it was pretty much a straight line up until that point, so a, a real retrenchment uh, in our industry that lasted for, I mean, I would really say five years or more before we recovered. 9-11 was greatly impacted. I was working at the Ritz-Carlton in Puerto Rico and uh, many of my team had family members in New York so it was really having to deal with not just the financial impact which was absolutely terrible um, especially living on an island but all flights were stopped no one was coming in no one was getting out so we had people stuck in the hotel that couldn't get back that were from New York but you know really understanding where the staff were coming from and understanding that they had family there and what we needed to do. So it was a really challenging time. It took a long time. It felt like it took a long time to um, change. I think we learned a lot of the, a lot of best practices back in 2001 and then 2008. It's very different because it wasn't a pandemic. But there were many great practices. We had got a lot of PIPs in place, a lot of profit improvement plans. So we took a lot of those best practices back from those days and we used them when we, we came into the pandemic. I was the, the director of rooms at the Grand Hyatt in, in Bangkok um, about five years ago when unfortunately we had a tragic bombing that took place um, next to the next door to the hotel um, in a shrine. Um, and it was it was pretty horrific when you when you think about tragedies, there was there was lives lost, um, including some of my team members who had to, who happened to be nearby. Um, what happened that day, although horrific um, will always sort of warm my heart as well because without thinking about it my team at the hotel rushed heard the noise rushed out of the hotel and started helping people without question whether it was um, you know pulling injured people into our hotel to, to get them what they needed to get emergency care literally the mobilization of, of, of over 100 team members running out in the streets and pulling people into the hotel to help them. So obviously much more of an acute tragedy, um, but what I saw that day in the, in the goodness of people and of, of human kindness and of, of what we do in hospitality truly come to life to, to care for people is something that I will, you know, as a leader and as a person, never forget. Wow. Uh. 
I'm uh, speechless. Um, thank you for sharing that. Okay, so I just need to warn you. Um, I'm about to ask a question, and it's kind of a cliche question to each one of these leaders, but stick with me through this first part because I have a way of turning this one over on its head. And when I do, you're about to see something that I think is uh, a little magical. Got it. So we have an idea of when you started uh, your journey in this industry. And um, if you could go back and see that former version of yourself, what advice would you give to that person? Don't put so much pressure on yourself. Enjoy it. Have fun with it. Bring your full self to it. Don't worry so much about whether you're doing things exactly by the book or, or perfectly um, because nobody has all the best answers. Sort of trust your intuition and um, let people in. Bringing more of your true self to your work. Like it's going to be okay. At the end of the day, it's going to be okay. So make sure, you know, you're doing it for, for you and for your team and you're enjoying the process along the way. I think I would probably tell myself to let go a little more. I remember when I was a spa director or even after hairstyling on cruise ships, I would get evaluations that said Suzanne needs to let go. I would also tell myself as that young, big curly haired 80s hairstyle, hairstylist, that um, don't be so hard on yourself. You know, you, I think sometimes you worry about so much what other people think of you that you forget to worry about what you think of yourself, you know, and and following your own principles and your own your own foundation and where you come from. So I think we, I think as you get older, that's one of the great things about getting older. The wrinkles suck, but the um, you get easier on yourself. You have more confidence in yourself, and you don't beat yourself up quite as much about things as you did when you were younger. Being proactive is is something that you know you. You have to you have to learn and, and in hospitality, um, but there's not always there's not always a set way, um, and so it's really being proactive to know all of your resources at you know kind of an arm's reach and those the importance of maintaining those internal relationships, and so I think those are skills that you grow grow you know grow with in hospitality and you grow with over the years, um, but I sure do wish that I had embraced them a lot earlier. I think the first thing I would have said is you're in for a you're in for a wonderful ride and you have no idea at this point how great and wonderful the people are that you're going to work with in the coming 20 years. I'm, I, I say this without being embarrassed that this industry has changed me as a person. <laughs> that sounds like uh, some pretty good advice. Okay, here's the part where I flip it around and pay very close attention to the look on their faces and the way they feel. And you be the judge if you see something magical happen to them. Let's flip it over now. If you can remember um, being that younger, ambitious version of yourself, and uh, if you were to come face to face with who you are now, uh, what would that younger version of yourself think about what you've become? That's a great question. It's a really great question. And, you know, and sometimes I started as a hairdresser, you know, in it's, you know, just outside of London. And I, you know, I, you always dream of it. You always dream of these big roles, but I never guess I never really did see myself in this, in this position. And sometimes after you've beaten yourself up so many times, you don't think you do this well enough or you don't, sometimes you just, I, I do sometimes stop and look and go, oh my goodness, I've really achieved a great deal. I'm in a career that I adore with people that is the best people in the world. I think our industry has the best people in the world. They've been my family and especially in the last difficult times of, of the last year. Um, they've supported me and it's and I sometimes sit there and it's rare. It's a it's a rare moment but I all of a sudden say I'm proud of myself. I'm really proud of where I am today and the role I'm in. And you always want to get better but you sometimes you just have to sit and say I did good. I did good. You know, so yeah, I, I would tell myself that today, that old that, that little hairdresser. Thank you. Thank you. No. <laughs> I think they that person would express surprise that we that I became so committed to this industry. I think that's would express surprise and really would want to understand what you know, what is it about this industry that has 
kept you so committed to it over all these years? I wouldn't have believed it, but I wanted it. And I, and I kind of knew it at, at, you know, I knew at a young age that I wanted to grow and that I wanted to take more of a strategic role in spa and wellness. It meant a lot to me. I've always been really passionate about what we do for people. So I could have seen this as my, I'll never get there, but I'll keep trying a uh, position and um, that it was possible to come from a, you know, sweeping hair in a, in a day spa to, um, being in the position that I am today, but I'm ex exceptionally grateful um, for the for the journey and for, for where I am today. The reason I love positioning this question this way is because when we look back uh, and think of that younger version of ourselves, we think we have so much advice to share with them because of what we've gone through and how much further we are now than when we were then. But that younger version of ourselves has the greatest lesson to teach our older self still, they're still holding that piece of something that most of us forget and lose on this journey. They remember the reason we got started along this path. They were the living, breathing embodiment of the why and where you are today. They remember your why. Back in that hair salon, I would see my stepfather um, work all day long. He, he worked on his feet 12 hours a day. He was a fantastic colorist. And people, and again, mostly women, would come into the salon and they would, um, you know, have had a hard day or had, had, you know, come from work or working and then kids and a little like downtrodden. And he would, they would sit in his chair and more than a colorist or a stylist or a massage therapist or, or name any of the above, he was kind of like a counselor and he would listen to them and they would share their stories and he would talk to them and then he would transform how they looked and that would impact how they felt and they would markedly walk out of that salon time after time so much lighter almost floating like just the joy was so noticeable and so I always believe that what we do helps kind of fix people up and, and give them some strength and give them some power and, and give them some joy so that when they walk out of our spaces, they're just a little bit kinder to everybody else. And so little by little, I feel like that's how we in this industry just make the world a better place. When I first started on cruise ships, I did some um, services and treatments. And um, I remember a guest and um, this guest was a in, her health wasn't particularly great. She spent about a month there. So she would almost come to see me every day. And I felt with that one guest, and this was 25 years ago, that I, I felt that I impacted her life by trying to get her on the right path of wellness, even 25 years ago. You know, she still writes to me today. And um, oh, wow. yeah, she still writes to me today and says this was a day that she felt that, you know, her health and she'd, she'd gone through, she'd lost her husband and things like that. And she said she felt that was the very first day that she had got her, her, her fingers on the edge of the hole that she was in and that it still makes me cold I mean I still go cold and get shivery now you know when I think about that time because if you're going to make an impact on one person in your life then it's, that's just that's the goal isn't it I guess when you do you want you know I made the most money and you know I'm a revenue I love my revenue making but do you, or do you want that you impacted people's lives you know or did I work a million hours a week you know, for me, it's, I think for most of us, it's how we impacted others. What did we do to help others? So I think that's probably, probably most impactful for me. I inherited a company whose mantra was healing humanity through touch. I saw a lot of the power of individual interactions with one-on-one -on -one with employees, with friends, uh, with, with people being there. I kind of felt like my personal purpose was to put as much positive energy out into the world while I was there. And through those actions, that's how we live on into the future. Mm -hmm. We do things to help other people who help other people. And that's your legacy. I've had a lot of different opportunities to kind of shape where I want that impact to be or what I thought it would be. Um, but the pandemic has really brought it full circle as well and now into a completely new role but still within the same space and I really want to have a positive impact to people within our community and people within our society and people within the world greater that impacts their ability to 
live longer, happier, and healthier lives. And I think it's really that simple, um, but it's also really that big. But the pandemic is really, maybe first and foremost, realized that starts at home. That starts with me, and and I have to embrace that. I have to do that. I have to I have to be a leader and and walk the walk and do that for myself first and foremost before I can want to pass on that impact to anybody else. Well, um, I would love to personally thank each one of these panelists about to take the stage with you there today and the time they spent with me on camera, the stories, the vulnerability that they shared. I truly appreciate it. Suzanne, Jessica, Jim, William, I thank you. Uh, they have been such a positive impact to our industry, to many of us personally, and I thank you all for what you do in our world and especially what you mean to our beautiful spa industry. And until I see you all again, Stay magical and see you later.